Canto 23 of The Paradise is full of images to do with, on the one hand, being able to be the dwelling place of your desire, whether you can hold within you, can take within you that which you most long for, and in a way that around which the whole of life, not just your own life, is orientated, whether you can take that within you. But also, whether that can give birth to something new. Um, it's full of images both of the womb and in particular the Virgin Mary who's going to appear to Dante in this canto. She who was able to say yes and so carry the divine within her like the supreme contemplative we've been hearing about in the previous cantos. But also that was to give birth to the divine in life, in mortal life, as important for sharing in the divine life, which Dante the Pilgrim um, is on the cusp of entering a new capacity for, I think, even as he's on the cusp of entering new dimensions of the cosmos. But also Dante the poet um, needs to be engaging with that as well, even as he's writing this canto, even as, even as we feel him reaching for the words that might convey this divine life, and hence passing that challenge on to us. Are we capable of becoming the dwelling place of our fullest desire, and so giving birth to that desire in the life around us now? It opens Canto 23 with a very lovely image. Um, it's one that's very much of this world, of nature, um, but very much about nature not just giving birth but also receiving from the life around it. Uh, Dante says that he sees Beatrice looking out like a mother bird awaits on the branch in the dusk before dawn, waiting for the sun to rise in order that she can go and forage for her chicks. Um, it's hard work, but it brings the mother bird great joy, Dante feels. And I don't know, this carries to me um, echoes of the pelican in her piety, this widespread medieval image of the mother pelican feeding her chicks from her own breast, from the blood that she draws from her own breast. Um, there's echoes of Beatrice being like Christ in this image. Um, but there's also an echo of the chicks there waiting. Um, you know, they want to eat, they want to be nourished, to find that food. But of course, they don't um, scream for food through the night. They only scream for food when the mother returns with something for them to eat. And so there's something about Dante as the chick here, patiently waiting expecting the dawn, though with the important difference that whereas Beatrice knows where to look, and Dante the poet describes her as looking up to the zenith in the sky, this, the point in the sky where the sun is at its height, greatest height, um, showing its fullest strength, um, which is going to be um, the line of direction of sight into um, the heavens from which the vision of this canto is going to come. Beatrice knows where to look, whereas Dante doesn't know where and how to look, like the chicks don't yet understand where the food comes from. And so as he says, his hope becomes the very anticipation, the desire and the longing to know what he sees Beatrice knows, even though he doesn't quite know it fully yet, but is becoming capable of taking it in becoming capable of being the dwelling place of his greatest desire. And then the first vision of the canto unfolds. Um, it is a vision of Christ. Um, Beatrice says, look up, and Dante sees the sky of this high heaven fill with stars, um, much like the Milky Way will fill the night sky with a blaze of sparkling light. And Dante says that he knows that all these lights are lit by the sun. And I think what that means is that all 
light shares in the divine light. It's a reflection or a refraction or an echo of the divine light. And he's seeing that blaze full on now. Um, and he says that he can't describe it. Um, it's too much, both for his sight, in fact, and therefore also for his description. When you read that, it feels in the first moment like a loss. I wish he could describe it. But of course, that has the effect of fostering the hope that's built on anticipation in us. It's that desire which is precisely what we need in order to see these sights that Dante himself is seeing through his desire and through the mediation of Beatrice. So this canto with its failure at words is actually the very blessing that we need in order to rise after Dante through the heavens. It's also worth noting, as Helen Luke does in her commentary on this canto, that Dante has the vision of Christ now instantaneously, fully. He sees it completely. Unlike, for example, when he'd had a vision of Christ at the top of Mount Purgatory, where many figures had appeared in a parade representing different aspects of the divine life. Um, there's an integration now here, which of course is the integration within himself. That means he is actually more capable of seeing in the round fully, all at once. And Beatrice explains that that which has overwhelmed his sight, at least for now in this instance, is the power, the wisdom, the strength of being itself. And so nothing, in fact, can overcome it. The fact that it's overcome him is the good news of what he is going to become capable of seeing by the end of the Divine Comedy. And Dante responds to that with another wonderful image. Um, it's the image of how thunder forms in the clouds, which in the medieval meteorology came about because a kind of charge built up within the cloud that ultimately the clouds couldn't contain. And so when it burst out of the clouds, you have the clap of thunder. Um, that is how Dante experiences what he, if you like, can't quite hold within himself. Um, unlike the Virgin Mary who is going to appear next, his womb, if you like, of the incarnation at this moment can't contain what um, has just streamed into it. And so he says it was the, the experience was a bit like that of thunder, um, tremendous, um, but actually rather shattering at the same time with the upshot that he can't understand what's just happened, even though he knows and in a way has seen what's just happened. And um, that's him explaining to us why he can't put words to it as yet. Beatrice, though, sees what's going on and comes to his rescue again. And as she often does, says, look at my eyes, look at me. And the reason why she says that to Dante now is because this is a reminder that Dante can now, in fact, look at Beatrice. He can take in how she mediates divine life to him, which, of course, he hadn't been able to do earlier on in the paradise. And so that has the effect of steadying him, of helping him regain his inner strength, regather the parts of himself that have felt fragmented by the vision of Christ. Um, to get back on, if you like, the track of integration, which is going to be so key to him being able to take in the one vision of God. He has previously, in fact, in this canto, called out to Beatrice, O oh, Beatrice, sweet one, loving guide. He's so grateful to her for having accompanied him, not just as it were showing him the way, but fostering within him the capacity, the power, to bear her smile, which is the capacity developing in him to resonate with the divine life itself, and so bear that. But for now, um, having felt it exploding from him, he says that it was like waking up from a tremendous dream. Um, the dream starts to fade as you awake, but he, come back, he comes back to himself in that awakening. And this balance between seeing, seeing too much coming back to yourself, being yourself, in order then to realise the power you do have 
to see the divine before taking the next step. I think that that iteration, if you like, is part of the development, um, fostering the capacity, even the initiation that Dante is working on um, doubly hard in this canto. He says it was a struggle. Um, he has to bring all that he can to this task, even as all that might be tries to flow into him. He addresses us next to uh, accompanying him in this dynamic and says, look, even if the great muse of music had offered all her power to me in this moment and I'd been able to work with it, that wouldn't have been one thousandth of what he needed in order to express what he had just seen. And he asks us to bear in mind that this sight is resting on mortal shoulders as we look to him to see what he was trying to look at. He says that his consecrated poem, The Paradise, needs to foster within him and within us the capacity to make a leap. He says it's a bit like meeting a barrier in the road um, that seems to bring the road to a stop, um, the road of his poetry, the road of his capacity and our capacity to see these things. But part of what that then demands is the capacity to leap beyond the road, the poem, the words, to see more than they can possibly hope to hold or contain because they're reaching towards that which is everything. And he also reminds us of the image that was at the beginning of the paradise about when we'd embarked on the boats of this journey with him, that we needed to be very wary that we could follow closely in his wake because it's easy to go astray. And he adds to that now and says that what's also required to keep up with him, what he also needs to keep up with Beatrice, is the ability not to spare his life. He must give his all. He says that this boat can't make the journey with a captain who's not willing to spare his life, even as the boat tries to find its way across these great seas. Um, this, I think, is partly what he's learned in Mars and in Jupiter, that he must give all of himself to become more than himself. His poem must give everything it's got in order to become more than itself. And that is another aspect of this dynamic for us to take on board. It doesn't stop Beatrice, seeing that he has gathered himself together once more, says, why are you now looking at my face when another vision is indeed appearing? Again, I think the vision appears, appears in part because Dante becomes capable of seeing it. And this is the vision of the Virgin Mary. She's described as the rose that bore the word. She's accompanied by lilies, more flowers, um, who I think are the apostles that were able to acknowledge what she had said yes to, what she had born in her womb, but also given birth to in full life. And Dante says it was like seeing a beam of sunshine coming through the clouds, lighting up a gorgeous field. Um, lots of images here to describe this wonderful vision. I think it's worth asking, you know, why it's the Virgin that appears to him at this point. Um, and it has the thing to do with this metaphor of the womb, of giving birth. Um, but the Virgin Mary is also the one that could say yes to everything. She, as it were, put herself completely and wholly. She sacrificed herself into the incarnation. Um, so she now is celebrated because she became the forerunner for the contemplatives, for Beatrice, for Dante, for us. And Dante then continues with more gorgeous images. Um, he says, what must it be like, ask yourself, to see appearing before you the one who he had called on as the morning and the evening star. Remember that Venus rising in the morning is the forerunner of the sun rising as the day breaks. Um, he says that he saw her whose sapphire ensapphires the sky. It's a wonderful neologism and wonderful image because in a way what Dante is saying is that much as having seen the, the glow and light of the planets, he realised that he'd seen the spiritual light that those planets are just sharing in, reflecting to us. 
So the very sky itself, the blueness of the sky, is but a reflection of the spiritual blueness, if you like, which the Virgin Mary herself shines with. And I think that must be as well the kind of yes of the cosmos itself to the divine life, the way that the cosmos itself did in fact become a womb, could give birth to the divine light, which is why we can know it as much in nature as in supernature. Um, this uh, two worlds, if you like, that Dante is experiencing almost as one now in this moment. So of being able to see nature shining with the greatest light that it can contain and make manifest. Dante then sees an angel descending, carrying a crown of stars. Again, the meeting points of these two aspects of reality. And commentators think that the angel is probably Gabriel, um, the one who originally made the Annunciation announcement to Mary. Now he appears to celebrate what that Annunciation led to. And the angel, presumably Gabriel, says that he will encircle and accompany her back to the highest height that the Annunciation, the Incarnation, her life was able to say yes to. And this, he uses the phrase that I found so helpful in understanding this canto, um, the dwelling place of our desire in singing his praise of Mary. And then Dante sees the vision ascend and disappear from his sight once more. Um, the lights are described in a beautiful few tercets and Dante then says that they disappeared to a shore that his sight isn't yet capable of seeing. Um, it's signalling um, where he's going to travel in these last sections of the Divine Comedy. Um, he's going to move from the visible cosmos, from the sphere of the fixed stars, into the premium mobile, which is that which gives birth and contains the dynamic of the world that we can see and know directly, and then enter, in fact, a whole new aspect of reality, the Imperium, which is the primary, if you like, dwelling place of God in God's self. He is truly going to be able to follow, also going to be able to bridge into this other reality because he has taken that reality into himself and made it part of who he is consciously, fully, capable of giving it some kind of articulation, knowing it, resonating with it. But for now, he returns to the image that he began the canto with and says that as he looked up and saw the Virgin Mary returning to the Imperium with the lights following it, um, he says that they reached after her as a child will reach after its mother reach out to its mother even after a, a wonderful and lovely feed. Um, there's an echo here of the chicks and the mother bird at the end of the canto. They're singing the Regina Chaney, glory, praise to thee, O Queen of Heaven. And the canto ends with Dante celebrating how wonderful nature, the cosmos that he's known, life, is because of this higher life that has been sown on it, within it, and what that can give birth to, what that can sprout in the world around us. But it also ends with us wondering what's it going to take for Dante to make this leap, to not just take in and try and contain within his womb the light of God, but to give birth to that light in himself as well. How is he going to take the next step and not be shattered again like the thunder shattering a cloud and so have to wake up from what seems like a dream to regather himself. How he's going to do that is going to become immediately clear in the next canto.